So just to welcome you all here today in the name of Our Lady, it's very good that we are here on this Saturday, the Saturday when Our Lady waited for her son to rise from the dead. Yeah, this is why Saturday is a, a day dedicated to Mary. She's the only one who believed in the resurrection. And we are all here to ask God that this power of the resurrection should touch all the different aspects of our lives. Christ is truly risen indeed, and Christ at the right hand of the Father is looking down upon us with great affection this morning. And in his name and in the name of Our Lady, I want to welcome you all here today. And we are here to pray for miracles, yeah? Not only for ourselves, but in the lives of all the people around us, yeah? The many people around us in all kinds of strange situations. And we want to ask God really through the intercession of Our Lady that for resurrection in their moral life, in their spiritual life, and we all know people, family, friends, children that we have, who need to be touched by this grace of the resurrection. So already at the beginning of this day, we want to somehow have that context and we want to hold in our heart all those people we know uh, close to the church and far away from the church who need to be touched by the grace of Our Lady, by this gift of the resurrection, that really death has been overcome, that sin has been overcome, and a new life is possible in Christ. I'm very happy this is the second time the day with Mary has come here. It's always uh, a blessing to have this day. I noticed last year when they came and they left, there was a kind of tangible atmosphere that they left behind. And you notice that when Our Lady is present, somehow everything has a certain taste and flavor that you can't put your finger on it, but you know that Our Lady and her presence is there supporting and accompanying you in all the struggles and in all the problems and so on that we have. Yeah? So I want to welcome you here uh, very much this morning. So we said the Ave Maria. Ave Maria. be prophets yeah he said you read the sun and the moon and nowadays we have satellites and tell us the weather and all of this and he says but how is it that you cannot read what is going on how is it that you cannot understand the events that are surrounding you in this moment because a prophet is not a fortune teller a prophet is someone who has discernment over the events that surrounds their life and the life that they, of the nation in which they are living and I think it's very important because if we look around us, there's a lot of really crazy stuff going on. We seem to have lost even the use of reason. In many ways, things that are happening today are simply stupid. Yeah? We have lost all wisdom. And we have to ask God, who is the Lord of history, why is he allowing all of this? Why does God permit the church to be put on trial? Why does God permit all these problems that we see around us? Surely God, who is the Lord of history, could prevent all of this. And also at a personal level, all of us have trials and tribulations in our own life. And because we are Christian, it's not that God puts a fence around us and spares us these trials. And we see in this gospel that he doesn't even spare his apostles these trials. Yeah? At a certain point, Jesus says, let us cross over to the other side. In other words, he wants his disciples and his church to pass from one shore to another shore. In other words, they have to make a journey of faith. And the other side doesn't only represent a geographical journey, it represents in the end heaven. Yeah? We are all called to cross over this lake, which is this life, and pass and become people of heaven. 
And heaven is not simply a kind of place that we go to after we die. Heaven really is a state, a way of being, a way of relating to God and relating to the Father, in which we already begin to relate to the Father at a level of intimacy, at we begin to call him Abba, and we begin to discover already here on this earth that it's possible to live an intimacy with God as Adam and Eve did, an intimacy in which we know him, we love him, and we serve him. And so Jesus, looking at his apostles in this moment, his apostles in many occasions were not very impressive at all. Yeah? We tend to think of them as heroes or something like that. But if you read the Gospels very carefully, you will see that there were 12 weak, poor men that Jesus Christ chose. And so for them to pass to the other side, really Jesus is talking about a transformation of life a real change of life, which is not only a question of giving up sin, but a new way of being in the Holy Spirit that he wants them to pass to. And for this to happen, they have to make this journey across the lake. Now, you know in the Bible, water and the symbol of water is not only a symbol of cleansing, it's a symbol of chaos. It's a symbol of all the things that can fall upon us in life. And the biggest of all of these things is the reality of death. And so Jesus says, let us make a journey through death to the other side, and let us pass to the other side. So they get into this boat, and this boat is a symbol of the church. Yeah? The church today, which is almost swamped. In some countries, it's practically disappeared in certain parts of Europe. This boat looks like it's sinking. Yeah? And so Jesus, with these uh, fishermen, he, Jesus the carpenter gets into this boat, yeah? And what happens here is more or less what happens in our life and often happens, I would say is happening in the church, is that these fishermen tell Jesus, he says, okay, we have been fishing in these waters for years and years and years, and we know how to cross this lake. We have been here many times before, yeah? So what we want you to do, you're a carpenter. We want you to just sit down at the back of the boat, yeah, and maybe have a sleep, and we will handle this journey. We will organize things and we will arrive to the other side on our own strength, with our own capacity and resources and so on. And so Jesus accepts this invitation. Yeah? Why does he accept this invitation? Because he wants to teach them something. He wants to teach them that without him they can do nothing. And one way of teaching them is to allow them some failure, allow them to pass through this storm. And so what happens? Jesus sits at the back of the boat, yeah, and he falls asleep. He has a big siesta. Maybe he's just had a nice pasta lunch, I don't know what, yeah, they were eating in those days, bread and salt or whatever. And Jesus says, I accept your invitation. You have decided that you don't need me, you have decided that you don't want me, and that I am simply a passenger in this boat, ready to go to the other side with you, yeah? So what happens, yeah? Maybe this journey starts very well. Maybe the boat really begins to make some progress, but like life, a storm appears at some point. The Lake of Galilee is a place where you can be one moment in the perfect calm, and the next moment, because of the geography of the valleys that surround this uh, lake, the next minute you can be in a massive storm. Yeah? The waves can be 10 feet high and all of this kind of thing. And it's a good image of life, you know. We usually in life just want to be calm, no problems, yeah? A little bit of security, a little bit of comfort, a little money, and the husband is not troubling us, the kids are being obedient. And we just want a flat life, yeah? A flat, plain life. And Jesus doesn't accept that at all. And so God, in the middle of this flat life and this very calm crossing, he allows a storm to rise, yeah? And he has allows an enormous storm to rise, so much so that these fishermen begin to question the ability to handle this situation. And not only, but they begin to understand that if they don't do something, they might be dead quite soon. Yeah? They might be, you know, 30 feet under the sea or however deep this Lake of Galilee is. Yeah? In other words, a crisis appears. Yeah? And the same crisis that appears in our personal life is also in the church today. This church is named after St. Michael, and you know the prayer of St. Michael, where it came from. Pope Leo XIII, I think it was, at a certain moment after Mass one day, collapsed, and they thought he had died or had a heart attack. 
And when they, dis when they when he recovered, he, he, his priest and his bishops around him said, what happened, yeah? Because they understood that he had seen a vision, a bit like Zechariah in the temple. And apparently, according to some of these sources, what he heard was a dialogue between Satan and Jesus Christ, in which basically Satan was saying to Christ, I can destroy your church, yeah? If you give me sufficient time, and you give me authority over the people who would serve me, I can clean your church from the face of this earth. And apparently in this conversation, Jesus Christ agreed with this proposition. Yeah? He says, I think that's a good idea. Let us put this bride of mine on trial, and let us pass through this boat of Peter through a storm, because this is what the church needs in this moment. And so if you look at the history of the last century, and also what's going on today, you will see that the church has been persecuted in a way that's unbelievable, yeah? Last century was the century of genocides. In communism, under Stalin, something like 80 million people were put to death. Under Mao Zedong in China, another 80 to 100 million. In Cambodia, I think it was three to five million, yeah? We have seen bloodshed on a scale which is unheard of, yeah? Some people say a statistic is that more people died in the last century than the first four centuries of the church put together. And this has been permitted by God. Yeah, this is a scandal. Today we're going to speak about the book of Esther. You know that at the foot of Our Lady here is a star which is called the Star of Esther. Yeah? And in the book of Esther, God gives permission for this enemy of Israel to have power over Israel and to come close to totally wiping out the people of Israel in the Persian Empire. Yeah? And we see in this gospel that Christ allows this. Yeah? He permits this and he wants this. Why? Because he wants a transformation of these apostles. Yeah? He wants them to learn how not to depend upon themselves, which is exactly what they are doing in the middle of this storm, is they are trying with all their knowledge as fishermen to manage this situation and it's simply not working. And the sign that it's not working is this boat is about to sink and totally be wiped out. So at the last minute, yeah, at the last minute they decide to turn to Christ. Just imagine, yeah, and Christ in this moment is sleeping in the arms of his father. This is how I have problems sleeping at night. I don't know if you do, yeah. And a lot of those problems come from anxiety and fear. And you see in the middle of a hurricane, it's unbelievable. Jesus Christ is having a siesta in the back of the boat, and the boat's about to sink. Where does he find that confidence and that strength? It's because Jesus Christ, at every moment of his life, always was sleeping in the arms of the Father. Most of all, when he climbed onto the cross. Yeah? He called his Father, Abba, Daddy. Yeah? And what Christ wants is that he wants to take these apostles and he wants to introduce them into this relationship so that they can find in his Father this same place of rest and consolation because once they go out into the world, this church is going to be persecuted and they are going to have to know how to live and move in the Father and in the Spirit if they are going to carry out this mission and the whole thing is not going to collapse. So he has in view, and he's permitted this trial for their formation in faith. Yeah? So what do they do? They do what we do. Yeah? When everything is about to sink, yeah, we remember that Jesus Christ is in the boat. Yeah? We remember our faith and we turn to Jesus Christ, not in confidence and faith, but they accuse him. They say, you don't care. You don't care about the situation of the world. You don't care about the situation of the church, and it's a scandal that you are permitting us to experience this weakness and this trial here. Yeah? In other words, it's not in prayer and adoration they turn to him, they point the finger at him. And Jesus Christ wakes up, yeah? and this is maybe what we can do today. We can speak to Jesus Christ in the back of the boat, holy church, and maybe he's been sleeping for a long time, because we feel we can manage, yeah? maybe we need to turn to him and wake him up. We say, Jesus, now it's time to wake up. Yeah? The situation is becoming extreme. The situation and this boat is about to sink. Yeah? 
You really need to wake up and you need to display that you are the Lord and Master of this boat and this ship called the church. Yeah? And what happens? Yeah? He wakes up and he rebukes this storm and this crisis is over. And then he turns to his apostles and he says, how is it you have no faith, not some faith, how is it that you were not able to enter this storm and to pass through it? Why is it that you are so frightened and anxious? Yeah? And they are filled with awe. In other words, they begin to understand who the person of Christ is and little by little in their hearts is born this confidence in the authority of Christ. Yeah? So this is an image of where we are. Yeah? This is an image of the church and this is also an image of how we live. It's very beautiful. I'm glad I read the first reading because that's also the first reading. You see that in the life of David, he committed his big sins, not when in the early part of his life, when God called him, he lived like a refugee. He was always on the run. He never had a place to stay for too long because the king Saul was after him and wanted to kill him. And in those situations of infancy, David was close to God because of the precariousness of his life, because he didn't know tomorrow where food was coming from, and he didn't know tomorrow where he would live or where he would be. And what happens, yeah? What happens is that when he becomes successful, when he becomes settled, when he builds a nice beautiful temple for the Lord and he puts the Lord in it and a palace for himself, he becomes complacent, he becomes, he loses his edge and he loses that sensitivity to the will of God. And in that moment, even before he commits adultery with Bathsheba, David is already sliding and he's going down a slippery slope because he has become too settled, too proud and too confident in himself. And what will God do? God will allow David to experience that he will hand him over to his enemies once again. He will put him in a storm and he will put him in a struggle. And in this struggle, David will learn once more to be humble again. He will learn once more to depend upon God. And in the end, he will finish his life in a good way. Blessing God, looking towards the kingdom of God and looking for what God has in store for him. Yeah? That's why the cross is a blessing. That's why if you have a cross in your life today, at some level, like St. Paul, whose conversion we celebrated this week, yeah, we have to ask God in the end that we say, God, thank you for this cross, yeah? Because through this cross, you make me humble, you make me depend on me, and as St. Paul says, when I am weak, then I am strong. That's where my strength comes from, when I learn how to depend upon Christ for everything. Uh, I think I'll finish there because I've been given 15 minutes and my, I've been very good on time myself. So we will speak more this afternoon. Yeah? I think I wanted to speak about the book of Esther because I just discovered that Our Lady of Fatima is linked. Yeah? You know, the 13th of Ada, I think, is the Jewish feast of Purim. Yeah? And if you see with Our Lady of Fatima, everything seems to happen on the 13th of the month. Yeah? And so there's a link between this image of Est in the Old Testament and the Virgin Mary. Anyway, we'll say more about that. I better close there. O Immaculate Virgin Mother of the Church and Refuge of Sinners, we join together to consecrate ourselves to your Immaculate Heart. We consecrate to you our whole being, our entire life, all that we are, all that we have, all that we love, our body, our heart, and our soul. To you we consecrate our families, our priests, sisters, parish council, societies, choir, altar servers, lectors, extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion, all the young people and young families of this parish, all those who no longer come here, we place them all in your Immaculate Heart. We entrust to you the sick and the dying and the souls of the faithful departed and the entire parish family of Our Lady and Saint Michael. We desire that everyone may know and share in the benefits of your mission of love. 
so that our consecration may be truly efficacious and persevering, and so that it may bear fruits of a rich interior life. O Mother, today we renew our consecration as Christians and our baptismal promises. We formally promise our fidelity to the truths of the Church with joy, humility, and firmness of will, following the teachings of our Holy Father, our Bishop, and the Magisterium of the Church. We promise to pray the Rosary, to listen to the Word of God, to obey His commandments, to participate in the solemn feast of the Church, to seek strength in the sacraments, especially the Sacrament of Reconciliation and the Most Holy Eucharist. We pray that we may always be ready to offer our actions, prayers and sacrifices to anticipate the triumph of the Lord's Kingdom in our souls, in those of our brothers and sisters, in our parish family and the entire world. Amen. Amen.